Today we're going to talk about HIV and AIDS. This is actually a good segue to two lectures ago when we talked about emerging infections because this virus, in my view, is the quintessential emerged virus. You'll see it came from an animal reservoir. It's a zoonosis, but it has completely adapted to humans. So it is it is a stable relationship now. It's not an evolving relationship any longer. It's transmitted well among humans, causes disease. And I can't think of any other contemporary virus that fits the bill. So when we talk about emerging infections, this, this is it. Maybe when smallpox emerged many, many years ago, it had a similar impact. So if you are interested in the history of this disease, I recommend highly this book, The Origin of AIDS by Jacques Pepin. Uh, Dr. Pepin is a physician who actually worked in Africa and saw firsthand uh, what he thinks are the origins of, or the reasons why AIDS emerged. We'll talk a little bit about his ideas today. And I just want to show you that quote at the top there. This tragedy, of course, is referring to the AIDS pandemic was facilitated or even caused by human interventions, colonization, urbanization, and probably well-intentioned public health campaigns. So he's suggesting that the AIDS pandemic is actually mostly our fault. So we'll talk about this a little bit today, but terrific, terrific book. He goes over the data which support this idea. So this story begins uh, back in 1981, the June 5th uh, issue of Morbidity and Mortality Weekly Report, which is a weekly document issued by the Centers for Disease Control, which documents uh, recent outbreaks that are going on. And in this one, uh, it was a report of pneumocystis pneumonia in Los Angeles. And you can see here in the period October to May, five young men, all homosexuals, were treated for biopsy confirmed pneumocystis carinii pneumonia at three different hospitals. Two of the patients died. All five patients had laboratory confirmed previous or current CMV infection and candidal mucosal infection. So this was really unusual that you had five people who had this very rare lung disease and other what we call opportunistic infections. So the physicians who treated them were brilliant. They noticed this and they said something is going on here, right? Five patients, they made this conclusion. And look at the editorial note, pneumocystis pneumonia so it's pneumonia caused by pneumocystis, in the U.S. is almost exclusively limited to severely immunosuppressed patients. So that's why this rang a bell, because you only see this disease in immunosuppressed patients, not healthy people, as in these five young men. And they go on to say, all of the above observations suggest the possibility of a cellular immune dysfunction related to a common exposure that predisposes individuals to opportunistic infections. Brilliant. This was a brilliant conclusion from very little data. So from this point on, the case built, but it took many years before anyone would care about this disease, aside from the physicians treating these patients. Even the newspapers wouldn't report it. Uh, that President Reagan did not mention the word AIDS for years into his presidency. And as a consequence, not much money went into its research. It's really, it was really pathetic. And if you want to read more about that, read And the Band Played On by Randy Schiltz, which is a personal uh, recounting of, of this frustration. I find this interesting because nowadays, newspapers would like to report every new case of influenza and Ebola and MERS coronavirus. They're, they have this morbid curiosity about infectious diseases, but they were all absent back in 1981. And I just wonder if the internet has made things different or if they have actually fundamentally changed. I would like, and if any of them are listening, I would like to know if you, today you would report the AIDS outbreak in a different way from uh, how you did originally. Okay, so um, initially uh, the CDC developed a case definition as they saw clusters of pneumocystis carinii pneumonia, PCP, 
and another disease, Kaposi's sarcoma, which is a skin cancer, they saw clusters of these happening in urban centers, never seen before. So the CDC established a case definition to try and track down the disease. They said anyone with Kaposi's sarcoma or opportunistic infections, because these are so rare in healthy individuals that they could use these to track down whatever it was that was causing this. In 1982, a year later, they called the disease AIDS, but until then it was called GRID, gay-related immunodeficiency, because people thought that this was exclusively a gay disease, and this is one of the reasons why many people didn't pay attention to it. And so for years, it spread and exploded, and of course it spread into other populations as well. It was eventually found to be transmitted, for example, at birth from infected mothers to the children and also heterosexually. But again, this bias for years, the name GRID alone really uh, inhibited progress. HIV turned out to be a lentivirus. The virus was isolated in 1983, two years later, from the lymph node of a patient that had lymph adenopathy, swollen lymph nodes. This is one of the symptoms of the infection as the virus is replicating in the lymph nodes in the CD4 positive T cells was cultured from the lymph node. You should uh, read uh, um, and the ba band played on to learn about how virologists were chasing this down, chasing down all the wrong avenues, but the scientist at the Pasteur was really, uh, really onto it. Blood test was developed in 1984, so once you have the virus, you can develop a blood test and start screening to see where this infection is. And eventually electron microscopy and sequence analysis revealed HIV to be a lentivirus which is part of the group of retroviruses. On a weekly basis, I get an email from someone telling me that HIV doesn't cause AIDS. Does anyone here think HIV doesn't cause AIDS? Uh, this is so infuriating. Unbelie and yesterday, someone sent an email to everyone in the microbiology department saying that HIV doesn't cause AIDS. <laughs> so the, the evidence is incontrovertible. You're wasting your time to even say HIV doesn't cause AIDS. I get emails on my podcast, pages and pages of emails telling me why HIV doesn't cause AIDS. I say get a life and move on to something else. This virus causes AIDS, there's no doubt about it, okay? And you go out there into the world and, and uh, spread this information to people who are not believing. They're a minority, obviously, but they're out there and they're wasting everyone's time. So uh, HIV is a lentivirus. Here it ha is how it fits in the retrovirus family. So it's a member of the retroviridae, these viruses that have reverse transcription. Uh, here it is down here, lentiviruses, HIV-1. There's also HIV-2, as you will see. Uh, and some of the other retroviruses we've talked about in this course are part of these other classifications. We've mentioned the HTLV, H H uh, human T-cell leukemia viruses as well. So this is a distinct family. And in fact, lentiviruses were known long before uh, HIV was discovered. This is what the virus looks like on the top. It's a typical retrovirus, has an envelope with glycoproteins in it. Inside is a capsid with a plus-stranded RNA, two copies of it, and reverse transcriptase and integrase and so forth, the RNA-SH, protease, all in the particle. The uh, capsid of, of lentes is a little unusual. It's kind of cone-shaped, as you can see here, not spherical. This is what we call a, a retrovirus with a complex genome. It doesn't just encode gag, envelope, and polymerase. All right, it does encode those structural proteins, polymerase, reverse transcriptase, the envelope glycoprotein. But you can see it also encodes many, many other genes. It makes lots of alternatively spliced mRNAs that encode small proteins that do a variety of things. And we've talked about a, a few of them. One of these is an antagonist of ApoBec. It gets packaged into the virus particle and prevents ApoBec from deaminating the genome when it gets into a new cell. So many, many other proteins are encoded here. That's why we call them retroviruses uh, with complex genomes. So these are a distinct group of retroviruses, uh, these lentiviruses. Um, HIV 1 and 2, as I said, fall into this classification. The HTLVs are a separate grouping among the retroviruses. We call those the lymphotropic uh, viruses. But the lentis, as I've mentioned, are not new. It took a while for us to realize that they were related to lentiviruses uh, that had been previously isolated from, for example, equine infectious anemia virus is a lentivirus 
uh, that causes immunodeficiency of horses. There are also feline immunodeficiency viruses. And people working on these figured out instantly that this must be a virus that is in immunosuppressing because the outbreak had all the characteristics of it. More reason to study obscure viruses that cause disease in animals. We are ready to understand HIV because we've been studying feline immunodeficiency virus and equine uh, infectious anemia virus, etc. So the disease was called AIDS. So the virus, human immunodeficiency virus, it had a number of other names before uh, it, we really understood what was going on. This is the final name. And AIDS is acquired immunodeficiency syndrome. And, and again, a syndrome is the occurrence of a characteristic uh, group or pattern of symptoms. And typically, you call something a syndrome before you understand what's causing it. So in the beginning, we didn't understand how this virus was causing immunosuppression. But even though now we understand better, the name has stuck. And as I said, a HIV causes AIDS, all right? No doubt about it. There is absolutely no question. And here we go. The AIDS denialists say that HIV doesn't cause AIDS. Many people have in inadvertently been infected with HIV-contaminated blood. In the hospital, before we learned to test for HIV in the blood, many healthcare workers were infected. Hemophiliacs who require transfusion on a weekly or biweekly basis, they were mostly wiped out from the United States because they received blood from pooled donors, much of which came from Haiti. There was a, actually a businessman in Miami who had a business of collecting blood in Haiti, paying people small amounts of money, and then pooling it to make red blood cells for the hemophiliacs. It turned out these were full of uh, HIV, so they were inoculated and they got disease. So there's just no question that Koch's postulates have been satisfied for this virus. Let me give you some numbers so you understand the impact of this infection on the U.S. and the world. In the United States, it's killed over 600,000 people, which is more than all the combat-related deaths in the 20th century. Uh, in the, currently in the U.S., over a million people are infected. The problem is that about 25% of them don't know that they're infected. As you will see, initially you may not have symptoms of infection, and this is why the virus continues to spread, because these individuals will pass it on to others. 2011, there were 51,000 new infections in the U.S., 70% in men, 30% in women, and half of these new infections in people 25 years old and younger. So they're going to have their lives, if they get antiretroviral therapy, they will have their entire lives uh, having this virus because we don't know how to get rid of it at the moment. <clears throat> I want to take you through a number of slides that I got from WHO to, again, make an impact on how serious this has been. So this is a, these are the latest numbers, 2012. Total number of people living globally with uh, HIV infection, 35 million. These are the ranges because, of course, you, you can't actually count every individual. You have to make estimates. Uh, adults, women, and children. Uh, newly infected people globally in 2012, 2.3 million. And AIDS deaths in 2012, uh, 1.6 million. 210,000 kids uh, dying of AIDS, most of them getting it from their mother at birth. Uh, adults and children living with uh, HIV in 2012, 35 million, and this is the global distribution. You can see Sub-Saharan Africa has the major burden. Every one of these slides, that will be where most of the infections occur. We have a lot in North America, uh, Latin America, South and Southeast Asia has a lot, but Sub-Saharan Africa is just uh, unbelievably high. The number of adults and children newly infected with uh, HIV, so where the new infections happen, so this is close to the number in North, in North America I just gave you, but again, you see 1.6 million in Sub-Saharan Africa, and they have the, the bulk of the new infections. This is substantial numbers elsewhere, of course, but uh, that, that area is getting most of them. Estimated adult and child deaths from AIDS, again, 1.6 million, Sub-Saharan Africa, again, is bearing uh, the brunt. Nothing really comes close except perhaps South and Southeast Asia in terms of deaths. Children less than 15 years old living with HIV, total of 3.3 million globally. 
again, 2.9 million, and astounding numbers in sub-Saharan Africa, spreading really uh, unchecked. And we're, we, many other countries are doing very well, comparatively speaking. And the number of children less than 15 newly infected in 2012, North America less than 200, so we can manage it quite well by diagnosis here. Uh, but Sub-Saharan Africa, where healthcare is difficult to come by, 230,000. So you can see Sub-Saharan Africa is really suffering the most. Est estimated child deaths, 210,000 globally. Again, Sub-Saharan Africa, 190,000. Most of them are here. The other countries, very few. So in 2012, 6,300 new infections a day, 95% in lower middle income countries, uh, 700 in young kids, and the rest in adults. And among these adults, 47% are women, and 39% uh, are in 15 to 24 years of age. The uh, HIV infections, despite these high numbers, they actually peaked uh, back in the 90s. Uh, the blue are the new HIV infections globally. Uh, these are the numbers here. Uh, and then they're slowly declining, but they're still quite high. And these are the deaths. The deaths lag behind the, the peak of uh, infections. So they peaked a bit later, about 10 years later, and now they're going down as well. But there's still substantial numbers, of course. As you heard when we talked about antiretrovirals, you can control AIDS with a triple combination of drugs. This is a pill called a tripla. Look, it has one, two, three on it. Isn't that clever? It has three different antivirals in it. You can see them here on the label. And this can control infection pretty well. Uh, but again, it costs money, and only countries that can afford it uh, can use it. Now, this is changing as Bill Gates and others contribute money to, to buying this drug and bringing it to countries where uh, there isn't money to afford it. So this is a graph of the number of people receiving this triple antiretroviral therapy in low and middle income countries. You can see back in 2003, the numbers were pathetically low, despite having millions of cases in these countries, very little uh, distribution of antiretrovirals. So to now in 2012, you can see the African region, which has most of the cases, is doing quite well. So over 9 uh, million people receiving antiretrovirals. But of course, that is not everyone. Um, here is a, num a graph showing the number of people eligible for antiretrovirals in low and middle income countries as of 2012. Uh, so 2010, you can see the blue is on antiretrovirals and the red is eligible for. So uh, 2013, again, uh, this is the distribution. So you see that there are many people who are yet not receiving them, but if we could get it to everyone, we could really bring down virus levels in the blood and you can really impact transmission as a consequence. Because if you have people continuing to live their lives as usual, transmitting the virus, that would be interrupted if you gave them uh, antiretroviral therapy. Nevertheless, even though we have these great <laughs> antiretrovirals, they're not perfect because you can't clear the virus from an infected individual. You can give them antiretrovirals. You can bring the plasma viral loads very low. They will feel pretty good their immune function will return, but the virus is still there. If they stop taking antiretrovirals, the virus will shoot back up uh, within a few weeks. There's no vaccine, of course, so we can't stop new infections, and people are working hard on that. Uh, you can't stop taking your antiretrovirals, otherwise it will come back. There is a long-lived reservoir of infected cells in our bodies, and back on TWIV 133, we spoke with Kathleen Collins at the University of Michigan, who thinks that there is a long-lived hematopoietic progenitor population in us that is cells that give rise to immune cells, and these are lately infected. They have genomes in them. They're not making virus. For some reason, the virus is shut off. But they have genomes, and eventually, uh, that's a source of new virus. You can get drug resistance, even though the numbers are, uh, uh, are pretty good for not getting it. You will eventually get it, so you have to change the triple therapy. These drugs are expensive. So as you've seen from the numbers, uh, AIDS is a third world disease now and spreading very quickly in sub-Saharan Africa. And only if we keep pushing these antiviral proteins are we going to be able to uh, impact it further. So the first question is up. Which of the following statements about the HIV AIDS pandemic is not true? Okay, the answer is number one. 
which is lentiviruses are unique to humans. They're not. We have lentiviruses of many other animals, feline immunodeficiency virus, equine anemia virus, simian immunodeficiency viruses, etc. And all the other statements are true. A quarter of HIV positive individuals in the U.S. are unaware that they're infected. More men than women infected in 2011 and half of new infections in people less than 25 years old. All right, so where did HIV come from? This is, as you know, a relatively new infection. We first noticed it in 1981. Well, the first studies uh, that were done, after we developed a, a blood test, we could start looking and seeing who is infected. We could look for antibodies against the virus, or we could look for viral proteins and say who is infected. And the first studies in Africa, in Zaire, and Rwanda, so D Zaire, of course, DR Congo, and Rwanda here. Studies in these two countries showed that uh, AIDS was very common there in the big cities. 90% of sex workers were positive for HIV virus. 90% of the sex workers in these big cities, and obviously they had been infected quite a long time before. This was a complete surprise. Uh, next, uh, archival samples were tested. So you go in the freezer and you look at serum that was frozen years ago from various people for various reasons, and you say, are there antibodies to HIV in them? And these results suggest that the virus was present in the 60s and 70s at several locations in Central Africa, but not in the west or the east of Africa. And then a serum sample in 19, taken in 1959 had been frozen. It's called ZR59 from a DRC adult male, right there, was found to be positive uh, for HIV-1 in 1998. So that's the oldest sample from which we can actually uh, obtain viral sequences by PCR and sequence them. And then subsequently a 1960 sample, a frozen lymph node from a female, and DRC also was shown to be positive for HIV-1. So we don't know why these individuals died. We don't know what illness they had. All we know is that they were infected with HIV-1 in 1959. So the virus was around a lot longer than in 1981 when that first report came out of uh, Los Angeles. These two viruses, DRC60 and ZR59, differ by about 12%. In other words, that's quite a bit of divergence. That means the virus has been diversifying in, in the human population quite a bit between 59 and 61. So it's quite clear from this work that uh, the virus was present uh, in Leopoldville, which is Kinshasa today, uh, by 1959 and 1960. And you can now do, you can take these sequence data and do clock, molecular clock calculations and figure out how far back uh, this virus was around. Now, before we do that, we have to talk a little bit about the diversity of HIV-1. There are four groups of the virus. Now, today, we, we identify four groups. They're called uh, M, N, O, and P. All right. Most of the infections in the world, 99% of HIV-1 are called by group M. The M means main. It's the main group of the virus. Then there's group O, which stands for outlier. It's less than 1% of infections, limited uh, to Cameroon and Gabon. Uh, and group N, there have only been 13 cases so far, all from Cameroon. Uh, and group P, only two cases. So you can see most of the infections are M and, and uh, much less from O. Turns out that each of these groups originated by an independent transmission of a related virus, simian immunodeficiency virus, or SIV, from um, monkeys to humans. Four independent transmissions gave rise to group M, N, O, and P. Okay, so this is a zoonotic infection. These are SIV, as simian immunodeficiency viruses are circulating in monkeys. We'll talk about this in a moment. So the groups are four independent transmissions from monkeys to people. A little bit more on these groups. Group M, because it's infecting so many people globally, is diversifying. And in fact, we split it further into subtypes. You see here on the upper right, group N is divided into nine subtypes. And so that's A through K. High-risk individuals, sex workers, will get multiply infected by multiple types, subtypes. 
and they recombine in these individuals and sometimes the recombinants are better fit than the original subtypes and they take over. They spread in the population because as you know a sex worker has contact with many people on a daily basis so if they have a virus that's very fit it will spread to other people as well. So uh, that's where we get recombinants. They're called circulating recombinant forms. Uh, there are 48 of those that have emerged so far. Again those come from multiply infected people. You get infected at one point and then a month later you get another virus and you get another one and you get all these multiplying in you and they can make recombinant genomes. As far as we can tell, there isn't any clear-cut difference in the ability of these subtypes to cause AIDS. There are a couple of observations that are interesting. For example, if you get a subtype D, you tend to die faster than other subtypes. We're not sure why. Uh, the shedding of subtype C in the female genital tract is higher than the other subtypes and this might lead to female to male transmission which is uh, somewhat rare and uh, this is spread extensively uh, in Africa. Nevertheless we just think that these different subtypes exist because they're all fit and they, it all depends on where someone introduces it. If someone goes to a sex worker in one place and picks it up then travels home, they introduce that subtype there and then it spreads in the population. Yes? So the different groups arose because of different transmission events mm -hmm. and the CRFs arose because of the recombination, but why did the different subtypes arise? So the subtypes arise because the, the original group M, for example, is infecting so many people that it's diversifying. The virus makes a lot of mutations and these are all consistent with virus replication so it diversifies. It's a measure of how long it's been infecting people and how many people. You see the same with influenza viruses and other viruses that spread as well. So basically what, we can, what we've learned is that HIV evolves in one direction to subtypes. So you start with a transmission from a monkey to a human then the virus evolves away from that. So if you sequence a lot of isolates, you can get an idea of when some, a virus was introduced into a population and how far it spread. So you construct the sequence of progress in a particular region by examining the distribution of subtypes. Now in the 90s, we developed tools, PCR, nucleotide sequence of large numbers of samples, bioinformatics. So that let us really start to study this. Sequence lots of isolates from all over the place. And it became very clear that the most diversity in the world was in Central Africa, more than anywhere else. So that means the virus was most likely introduced into Central Africa and it's had the most time to diversify there. And that's why we see so many different uh, groups and subtypes there compared to anywhere else in the world. So that's the kind of conclusion you can make by sequencing uh, all of these isolates. In some areas, uh, specific subtypes are, are associated with particular modes of transmission, heterosexual, homosexual, so sex worker, intravenous drug use, etc. And that's because of the founder effect. In an at-risk group, so a group at risk for infection because of behavior, a single subtype will predominate as soon as it's introduced into that group. So here's an example. Subtype B predominates in 96% of white homosexuals in South Africa. It was brought there from the U.S., so it had not been present in South Africa. Uh, it was introduced uh, into this group of individuals and it took off because it was they, they didn't have any other infection, so that is a founder effect. When you put one virus in, it's a particular subtype and it uh, predominates in that that group. Subtype C, 81% of infections of black heterosexuals. So each of these subtypes gets introduced and then it takes off because individuals tend to uh, have behaviors in groups. So intravenous drug users uh, stick together, they use the same needles and so forth. So uh, certain subtypes are going to predominate in that group and so forth. So this is a, a map of the global distribution uh, of these subtypes. So here on the left is the key, there, so the different subtypes and then the circulating recombinant forms are shown here. They're all different colors. You can see C is the light blue and um, that's here in, in sub-Saharan Africa. You can see uh, most of the subtypes are C there. Uh, and you can see globally C also predominates but there are many more of the others as well. And you can see in North America there's not very much of C. Yeah, there's mostly B. 
and it varies from country to country. Again, depending, there's a brand new virus introduced and then it's spread by people spreading it and then it diversifies and then whenever the infected people go, they seed with a particular subtype and that is what predominates in this region. So there doesn't seem to be any, any pathogenesis or virulence associated with partic particular subtypes, just a matter of when the virus is introduced where. The next question is, which is correct about HIV-1 groups and subtypes? Very okay, good. I thought you would get confused here by the, by the wording. There are four groups and nine subtypes of group M. That's the correct. The others are all incorrect. They're not classified according to receptor usage. They are not classified according to where they were isolated. Even though there are geographic limitations, that's not why they're classified. They're classified by sequence. They're not based on transmissibility. Okay, good. All right, so what was the source of HIV-1? This is a story largely worked out by Beatrice Hahn, who is shown here in front of the wall of polio. I had her daughter for virology two years ago. She was in this class which is pretty amazing, right? And I didn't even know she was in my class until the next year when she asked me for a letter of recommendation. But uh, Beatrice Hahn is a virologist who went to Africa to try and figure out where AIDS came from. I, just, I actually just interviewed her on Sunday for the podcast and she said the reason she got into this, she was interested, so at, at an early port it was point it was clear that SIV, simian immunodeficiency virus, was highly related to HIV. And someone called her and said, I have a dead chimp in the freezer. You want it? So she said, sure. And she isolated virus from it. And it turned out to, to be very informative. But it was a captive chimp who had died. And uh, someone said, you really need to go to Africa and collect spe uh, virus from wild chimps. So there are lots of wild chimps. Not a lot left in Africa, but there's still a good population. That's where each of these circles are. But you can't take blood from chimps. They're protected. So she actually went to Jane Goodall's um, collection of chimps, the Gombe Forest. And Jane Goodall is very protective of her chimps. She says, you know, you can't take blood from them. So they devised a way to detect virus in feces and urine. And the chimps would be up in the tree. And in the morning, they get up and urinate. And the people would stand under there with cups and catch the urine and uh, then bring it back at the lab and do PCR. And they could tell which chimp it was from by sequencing the mitochondrial DNA in the urine. So they could go back over and over and get urine and know exactly where it was coming from. So, and they did the same with, with feces. And if you ask Beatrice, she says, I have an army of shit collectors in Africa. She has lots of people. She doesn't go do that herself. And she collected lots of it over how many? 7,000 fecal samples from 90 field sites. OK, so this uh, showed that just one species of chimp uh, has SIV related to human. Actually, so chimps come in a couple of subspecies. There's pan troglodytes varus, uh, Eliotti troglodytes schweinfurthi, and then there's the Pan paniscus, the bonobos, which are related to chimps. None of these, uh, the only ones that have SIV are the pan TT, PTT, and PT schweinfurthi. Uh, and those are shown in the yellow circles. Now, chimps live in communities that are very isolated. They don't mix with each other. They don't swim, so that if there's a river between them, they don't mix. And so that's why you can have some chimp communities with the white circles here that have absolutely no SIV in them. So the yellow ones were SIV positive. And you can see they were in the area of Gabon, uh, Congo, and Cameroon. So again, near the epicenter of where we think uh, the HIV epidemic began. So a very important finding that these two kinds of chimp, only these two have uh, SIV, uh, CPZ, which is related to HIV. So SIV, CPZ, so there are simian immunodeficiency viruses in every primate and monkey species out there. And among chimps, it's transmitted by sexual intercourse. It's transmitted from mother to child during birth. And also when they, chimps fight and they get cut, so probably they can also transmit it that way as well. So this is a natural infection of chimp. And this is the estimated transmission probability per coital act among chimps I don't know how they figured that out. 
but it's pretty low, 0.008 to 0.0015. And as you will see later, it's similar to the rate in humans. That I could understand how they figured it out. As you'll see later, I'll show you the data. So this uh, virus makes chimps sick. It immunosuppresses them. And in fact, um, many of Jane Goodall's chimps would die over the years, and she would give samples to Beatrice Hahn, and she said, yeah, they're, H they're SIV positive, and they probably died from it. So originally, we didn't think that SIV made chimps sick, but we now know that it does, and it kills them off. So where did chimps get this virus from? So this is the tree that Beatrice Hahn and many others have constructed to explain what has gone on. So there are many different old world monkeys, as you can see here, these little guys, Sykes monkeys, Sudimangabees, Monas, red cap, mandrills, etc. Each of them have their own SIV, all right? They're shown here. So SIV, SYK, is the SIV that infects Sykes monkey. And uh, SIV, SMM, Sudimangabe, et etc. et cetera. In the old world monkeys, uh, the virus is not pathogenic. Most of these monkeys are okay. Uh, but they pass it among themselves and it's maintained in the population. Now, as you will see um, later, there's an HIV-2 that was discovered not too long after HIV-1. Uh, and that virus arose from the transfer of SIV Sudimangbi right into people. People, and this happened in a certain place in Africa whose name will become evident in the moment, where um, people have sooty mangabees as pets. And these tend to scratch people and transfer the virus. And in fact, I think there have been eight separate individual, independent transfers of SIV from sooty mangabees into people. Fortunately, HIV-2 isn't very pathogenic. Now, chimps, where did they get SIV-CPZ? Well, they got it from monkeys. It's actually a recombinant virus. SIV-CPZ is a recombinant of the Mona and the red-capped Mangabe SIVs. How would chimps get virus from these guys? Well, chimps are mainly vegetarian, but now and then they will eat meat. They will kill these little monkeys and eat them. This is actually a photograph I just found of a chimp eating a, a monkey leg. So that's probably how the chimp got SIV originally. This probably happened just a few hundred years ago, so it's a pretty recent event. And that may be why the chimps are still made ill uh, by this virus, because it hasn't quite adapted to them. So the chimps got SIV from uh, the monkeys, and they probably got doubly infected, ate two different monkeys and made a recombinant. And then that virus was passed on to us. And that is the source of groups M and N. HIV-1 in people, a cross-species infection from chimpanzees to humans. Groups P and O, not too many of those, groups P and O came from a gorilla. Gorillas have SIV as well, it's called SIV-GOR. And gorillas in turn seem to have gotten it from chimps. We don't know how that happened because we don't think gorillas eat chimps at all, but maybe they had an encounter at some point, but many gorillas are in fact infected with this virus. It makes them sick. And it's part of the reason for the decline in uh, gorilla populations. So you can see four separate cross-species introductions giving rise to the M, N, O, and P uh, subgroups. Two from chimps and uh, two from gorillas. And all of this happened at different times. It didn't all happen at the same time. So before we go on to explore this further, let me just explain uh, phylogenetics. I don't, I don't believe we've shown any phylogenetic trees yet in this course. Um, but here, I'm going to show you one now, and I'm going to explain to you what it is. I'm going to show you a phylogenetic tree where we're putting viruses on a tree according to their sequence. So these trees measure the distance between organisms and try to say which ones are related. And as you'll see, each division is called a node, and the common ancestor a node is the common ancestor of a virus on the right, which doesn't mean that we have the ancestor, but we're predicting that. For example, two viruses had a common ancestor. So if you have a common ancestor, it will branch off uh, and the sequences will evolve independently. And then all the way on the left, we assume to be the common ancestor of all the organisms of a tree. And to make these, you just compare the sequences of many isolates of organisms like SIVs and HIVs, and you arrange them in a tree. 
And uh, you can do this for one gene of the virus, if that's all the sequence you have, but it's better if you have the whole genome and you do genes independently. So that's a phylogenetic tree, which um, phylogeny, of course, has existed for many years, but since now we have many, many sequences, we can do phylogenetics. So here's the phylogenetic tree for all of these uh, chimp and gorilla SIVs and also uh, HIV in humans. So here are the M groups, for example, the N, uh, the O, and the P. So basically, we have sequences of all these genomes, and, and some of these are uh, other uh, SIV isolates as well. So here, for example, SIVCPZ from PT Schweinfurthi. This is the kind of chimp which was not the origin of HIV. You can see that all of these Schweinfurthi uh, SIV CPZs are quite different from the HIVs, and they all have a common ancestor, presumably, along with every, all of these other viruses. So presumably, some time ago, there was one common ancestor of all these viruses. We don't have that, of course. It's just inferred. The only thing we have are contemporary isolates, and so we make predictions. The gorilla viruses are shown here. So you can see HIV P clusters with the gorilla virus. Again, it was a common ancestor uh, in gorillas. Uh, and humans, and that is presumably the virus that we got. Uh, HIV O is there as well, so O and P uh, both um, came from gorillas. And then up here we have our PTT, uh, Pan Troglodytes Troglodytes SIV CPZ, and you can see that those viruses with all these funny names, those are the chimp viruses, they mix in very nicely uh, with the human viruses. In particular, this branch here gave rise to the M uh, and the MHIV. So again, two separate cross-species events, uh, this one leading to um, HIV-M and this one leading to N. So this is some of the data which show us clearly that HIV-1 groups came from cross-species infections from chimps and from gorillas. So when did this happen, how did it happen, and how did it spread? So the idea is that um, somewhere in the forest, uh, probably at the turn of the century, there were people hunting uh, bushmeat. And this goes on to this day, and chimpanzees at the time in the early 1900s were quite plentiful, so it was something that could be caught. And it's not easy to catch a chimp. They fight and you can get scratched. And of course, if you do manage to kill the chimp when you cut it open, you could contaminate yourself with blood. So the idea is that somewhere hunters have been contaminating themselves over the years with blood from chimpanzees who of course have uh, SIV CPZ in them. The idea is that um, one of these individuals uh, perhaps cut himself or herself, we don't really know, uh, then maybe many years later went to a brothel and then went to a, a sexually transmitted disease clinic. Um, this area of Africa grew very quickly uh, in the late 1800s and 1900s. These are populations of some of the big cities uh, in this central Africa here. You can see them shooting up exponentially. And Leopoldville in particular was the uh, most dynamic city. It was growing quickly, attracting traders. So this is a place where a, a hunter might have gone if he got tired of hunting or if he wanted to sell something. He would go to this big city, and that's a good venue to spread uh, the disease. Now, visiting a brothel, of course, he would put the virus into the population that way. But that itself is probably not enough to get this global pandemic going. There was probably something else that was needed. And that's why uh, the, this, the STD clinic is, is shown here. Because back then, so at, at about this time, Europe decided it needed to move into Africa and take over and bring health care and religion and all sorts of things to Africa because the U.S. was taken by the, the U.K., right? So Europe turned to Africa to colonize it, and they brought in STDs, clinics. Of course, with the growing cities, you've got prostitution and sex working uh, w growing, so STD clinics were put in place. And these people didn't have reusable syringes. They had to take glass syringes and boil them, and often they were too busy to do that. So probably if this person got some injection for what was thought to be some STD, uh, they, that was picked up in a syringe and then given to someone else. So the STD clinic itself would have spread uh, his virus. And, and of course, the sex workers were very busy. 
uh, in these areas as the cities grew, um, and uh, that could have spread the infection as well. Now the Belgian Congo, of course this area was taken over by Belgium for many years. I mean, they just took land and everything from the local people. At some point in the early 60s, the Congolese said, we had enough of this, and they kicked the Belgians out. However, most of the doctors in the country were Belgians, so they were stuck without physicians. Haiti said, you know, we speak your language, we speak French, and we would be happy to send physicians to the Congo and help you and teach you how to treat diseases and so forth. So Haiti sent a bunch of physicians in who stayed and lived there for many years. Get what, guess what they picked up and brought back to Haiti? They, they got infected with HIV and they brought it back to Haiti from where it probably spread to the U.S. because the Haiti, Haiti was a very popular vacationing place for people in the U.S. So that's what we think uh, initiated this. Yes? So if the, uh, if the earliest confirmed case via serum, uh, or the, the oldest infected sample is from 59, Right. Then what evidence do we have that suggests that this all started in the early 1900s? So we can work, we can do molecular clock calculations. So you can take the evolutionary distance between the 59 and the 60 samples, and then 60 to the present. And you can calculate how much the virus is changing every year. And then you can back calculate and get an estimate for when it went into the population. And that's what's on here. So M and O are estimated to have come into people in the first three decades of the 20th century. And N and P are more recent, but we, since there's so few cases, we don't have enough information to be able to clock that out. Okay? And so the idea is that these arose, let's say, 1920. Uh, Kinshasa was growing uh, at this time because of European colonization, the importing of workers and so forth, and uh, the spread correlates with the growth of these colonial cities. So probably if the Europeans hadn't come in and if these cities hadn't grown and, and there weren't STDs and reusing needles, maybe this epidemic would never have happened. Because I think that there's good evidence that that amplified it in Africa from which point it then spread to Europe and, and Haiti and the US and other places as well. Anyway, this is all pretty argued in that book, The Origin of Age. So if you want to know the details, uh, check that out. So as I said, the idea is that SIV infected a hunter originally, bushmeat hunting. Uh, he got exposure to infected chimpanzee blood. And a number of calculations have been done, okay? Uh, in 1921, you can figure out how many people there were in this particular area and how many of them were hunters and how many chimps they would have caught. So the idea is that probably less than 10 people got infected with SIV CPZ, but probably from only one did the virus spread and multiply. Just one. So this, all these millions of people that are infected today probably started with one person uh, in the woods hunting a chimp. I just find this amazing and scary in a way that a virus could do this, but we shouldn't be surprised. I think these uh, kinds of infections have happened before. I think they're happening today most likely because they're still bushmeat hunting and uh, none of them have spread. It's just this particular one. It was kind of a perfect storm of everything together. Uh, this, the growth of the cities, the STDs, the healthcare clinics, and so forth helped it to spread. But obviously, we keep our eye out for this now because there's always the potential that another virus might emerge because these SIVs are all over and they could get into people again. So quite an interesting story. So I, I've, I've already told you this, but European colonization, was thought to be a large, play a large role in the spread of HIV, establishment of large population centers. Europeans wanted to build railroads and bridges, so they took males from the countryside, moved them into cities. That's, that led to large-scale prostitution. Healthcare introduction to keep these people healthy. Uh, injections with non-sterile needles, transmitted viruses. And there's very good evidence that this happened in Egypt at the, in the, at the turn of the 20th century. Treatments for schistosomiasis spread uh, hep C to millions of people via contaminated uh, needles. So this was probably needed to, to amplify uh, the virus on a large scale. Uh, the other virus that causes uh, immunosuppression is HIV-2, first isolated in Guinea-Bissau uh, over here on the west coast. 
and uh, it's, a, it's quite distant from HIV. Again, this is separate transmissions from Sudi Mangabe, and there are eight distinct lineage, each from a separate infection. Uh, it is less virulent than HIV-1. Most of the infections don't progress to AIDS. It's less transmissible. It's no mother to infant spread. So it is, it is a much uh, less serious disease. But another example of cross-species transmissions, eight of them. And again, in this case, probably because people keep these animals uh, as pets. All right, our next one is something, pick something about SIV-CPZ, something that's correct. Number three was the source of HIV-1, of course. <coughs> A couple of other answers. It is pathogenic in chimps. It is not just spread via sex. It's spread by mother to child in the chimps and also by fighting, by blood. Of course, HIV-2 came from Sudi Mangabe's. So HIV transmission, let's talk a little bit about this. Now we'll talk a little bit about pathogenesis. It's not terribly infectious like measles. The uh, R naught is two to five, measles is 15 to 20. That's the number of people that can be infected from a single infected person. It's not spread by respiratory aerosols. It's not spread by fecal oral contamination. It's not spread by insect vectors. It is spread uh, by contact, sex, or intravenous uh, drugs, or at birth. And these are the modes of transmission in the U.S. from 1981 to 2003. You can see male-to-male -male peaked in the 90s and has since gone down. Intravenous drug use and heterosexual contact has been steadily on the rise in the main uh, mode of transmission. Globally, 80 to 85 percent of cases are, are heterosexually transmitted. And these are the rest, uh, homosexual interactions, intravenous drug use, uh, blood transfusions in the beginning, of course, many. Uh, we don't do that any longer, <clears throat> and unknown causes. This is a summary of, of where you can find virus, virus isolation and how much virus is present. Uh, you can see there's a lot of virus uh, in the plasma, the blood, and semen there's virus, vaginal and cervical secretions, and there are also infected cells uh, as well, virus in infected cells, PBMCs taken from the blood, peripheral blood mononuclear cells, uh, virus infected cells in semen and vaginal and, and cervical fluid. So clearly this is how the virus is transmitted by either uh, birth or sex or intravenous drug use. So here's an experiment that was done uh, in Uganda to figure out the, the likelihood of uh, infecting someone by the sexual route. These are couples, they're, they're called discordant couples. One has uh, HIV or is, has AIDS and the other uh, does not. And then you follow them over time, and you see how many of them uh, convert, how many of the partners convert to HIV positivity, and you measure that by just measuring RNA uh, in the blood. So these are different levels of viral loads here, from low to high, and these are uh, individuals with or without genital ulcer disease. The idea being that if you have ulcerations, that this will facilitate uh, infection with HIV. So you can see the probability of transmission per, per 10,000 coital acts is shown here. Uh, and so you can see uh, the blue here is about 0 0.001, per 10,000 or so. 0 0.001 is the probability. One in a thousand coital acts you're likely to acquire HIV. So that's not very high. Uh, it's about the same as, um, as occurs among chimps, which I noted to you before. Now, Someone last year after class remarked to me, that's great, I'm going to tell all my friends, but it doesn't mean that you need to have sex a thousand times to get AIDS, okay? It just means that it's a one in a thousand likelihood. It could be that first time or the tenth or the fiftieth time. So that's just a number, and uh, it doesn't mean that you shouldn't have safe practices. So that's where that number came from. The virus is not very stable. Its, it's, its infectivity is reduced by air drying, by heating, by bleach or alcohol, extremes of pH. But of course, sexual transmission and intravenous drug use bypass all of this. So you, know, you can inactivate it on the surface, but that doesn't help if you inject the virus directly into your bloodstream. So it has evolved to transmit in a way that avoids these, the harsh environment. Uh, as we discussed before, the virus binds to two different receptors on the cell surface. CD4 on T cells is, is one of them. And this is why the T cell, the CD4 positive T cells is one of the main targets. It also needs a co-receptor, which is a chemokine receptor, it can be either CXCR4 
or CCR5. And as we mentioned before, individuals who don't make CCR5 are resistant uh, to HIV infection. When you first acquire the virus, uh, the virus is binds to dendritic cells. So you remember when viruses enter you, dendritic cells immediately come to see what's going on and look to see if they're viral peptides because they're going to bring them back to the lymph node, right? Well, there's a, there's a lectin on the surface of dendritic cells. A lectin is a carbohydrate binding protein. It's called DC sign and HIV binds to it. So let's say you have a mucosal infection with HIV the dendritic cells come by, HIV binds to them, and then the dendritic cells go to the lymph node because that's what they normally do. And of course, the lymph node is full of CD4 positive T cells. So the virus is now exactly where it wants to be and can start replicating. It's a, it's a Trojan horse scheme, right? It's just so devious that, that the virus is, ta it's not replicating in the DCs, it's just attaching to the surface and taking a ride exactly to where it wants to go. So the virus is delivered to the lymph node, it replicates there, destroys uh, the T cells, you get a lot of viremia as a result, virus comes out of the lymph node, you're now highly infectious at this point. At some point, uh, virus levels go down after a few weeks, in six months you reach a set point, which you can then maintain for 10 to 20 years. Primary HIV infection clinical characteristics, many of the infections are, are, are symptomatic, but not all, so half of them can be, so half may be asymptomatic, so you feel fine and you don't modify your behavior, you pass the virus on to someone else. Uh, the incubation period, five to 30 days, and these are just typical signs of a virus infection. You couldn't tell what it was, right? You have no idea that it's not flu or norovirus or something else. Uh, with the exception of some of these, I'm lymphadenopathy, swollen lymph nodes, but that can be common for many, many other infections as well. Uh, two weeks. Prim again, after the primary infection, two weeks of symptoms, and then you're well. Um, in your gut, your gut is covered with uh, what are basically lymph nodes. This is called gut-associated lymphoid tissue. Those are these yellow dots. This is a healthy person's colon, full of wonderful lymph tissue. After a couple of weeks of uh, HIV infection, all the lymph tissue is gone. It's been destroyed by virus infection. So even though this looks very nice, this is not good. You need to have these lymph nodes uh, in order to help protect you. So in, that's all diagrammed here. Here's the initial infection. Then you have your two-week or three-week period of acute uh, infection. Uh, here is the virus in the blood. You have a peak, and then it goes down. So you're very infectious for this period, less so at this set point. You now have low levels of viral <laughs> RNA for many years. Uh, in that time, your CD8 cells are OK. Um, you even have an antiviral CD8 response, but your CD4 T cells slowly decline until you get to a point where you can't fight off other infections. You get PCP pneumonia, you get Kaposi's sarcoma, you get CMV infections or reactivations, and then you go into full-blown AIDS and eventually these opportunistic infections are, are the cause of death. So you have re replication throughout the course, and this is a long course. This can be 10 to 12 years, all right? You have active virus replication. There's virus in your blood. You are still infectious, and you can transmis uh, transmit the virus. Uh, as I said, the lymph tissues are major sources of virus replication. There's also virus in the CNS, the genital tract. You make 10 to the 10th virions in every day, and those get destroyed and you make new ones. The half-life of the virus in blood is less than six hours, maybe 30 minutes. Huge numbers of virus particles are turning over. And when viruses replicate to high numbers, what happens, especially if it's an RNA virus? You get tons of mutations. And that's part of the reason why you get drug resistance and why we can't probably make a vaccine, as you will see. So there are lots of sources of virus uh, in the body. There are CD4. Uh, T cells in the blood and in and lymph nodes, of course, um, and they're producing virus at a huge rate, as I've just shown you. And there are also uh, CD4 positive cells in other compartments. There are bone marrow CD4 cells. There are long lived uh, CD4 cells, such as this here 140 days, five days half life, probably even longer. These are latently infected, they have a genome in them, 
but from time to time they can move into the circulation and produce virus. So you have long-lived populations with viral genomes in them. Some of, them. some of these cells may live your lifetime, and so that's one of the reasons we can't get rid of, of the infection. The course of infection is different in different people. There's a typical progressor, which is the pattern I showed you, acute short infection at the beginning, long incubation period, followed by AIDS. There are non-progressors who have the incubation period but never develop AIDS. And then there are people who are rapid progressors. Within a few months, they're dead of AIDS, so a very different course. And we don't really understand uh, what controls these sorts of differences. These individuals who don't progress to AIDS, some of them are called elite HIV controllers. They have normal CD4 counts, very low copies of viral RNA in the blood. We used to think there was none, but now we know there are very low uh, numbers of RNA in the blood. They live for years and years and without antiretroviral therapy. One in 300 infected people are these elite controllers. So they're studied very intensely, as you would guess, to find out why and can we use this information to help others. And one of the things that correlates with being an elite controller is having a certain MHC molecule on your cell surface. As you know, uh, the MHCs are the HLAs or polymorphic. There are many different genes. And these two particular genes, HLA B57 and B27, correlate with being an elite controller. So somehow these a uh, MHC molecules are good at presenting the HIV peptides even as they change. So you remember when Infected cells present peptides to CD8 cells. They do it in MHC1. And those peptides are recognized by the CTL and the cells kill. But the virus changes the sequence of the peptide on an ongoing basis. And so most uh, MHC molecules can't present them anymore. But these two are good at it, and that's apparently why they can control uh, the infection. So it's not that they have attenuated viruses infecting them. It's that their genetic makeup is simply good at controlling. And this tells us that a cellular response is very important uh, for controlling infection. Our last question for today is during primary HIV-1 infection, which of these is correct? Number three, there is active viral replication in lymph nodes. Absolutely. There's no low levels of viremia. There's quite high viremia. There are symptoms. And you are certainly contagious. So it's number three. So why do you get opportunists? Yes. Did you say that uh, viremia is characteristic of a secondary infection, um, not the primary infection, but a later infection? No. The, you initially, when you first get infected, you have a burst of viremia, which oh. is quite high, and then it reaches a set point, which is lower. Yeah. So why do you get opportunistic infections? Well, one of the, one of the reasons you can guess, if you're destroying CD4 T cells, those are helper cells that make cytokines that allow you to make antibodies and CTLs. So that's part of it. But there are a whole host of other immune dysfunctions. And I don't want you to learn any of these, but just see that every immune cell population is affected, not just CD4 cells, but CD8s, dendritic cells, macrophages, monocytes, B cells, NK cells, all have problems as a result of this infection. And they're all having to do with altered cytokine production and so forth. So this explains why these individuals cannot fight off other infections. So AIDS is defined as a certain number of CD4 T cells per mil in the blood. You end up getting these kinds of opportunistic infections, uh, protozoal, bacterial, fungal, which do not happen in healthy people. These are only in uh, immunocompromised people, viral as well. The virus, of course, as you're making an immune response to the virus, your T cells are becoming activated. And the virus loves it. It replicates better in an activated T cell. So there's this cycle this incessant cycle of virus replicating, T cells becoming activated, virus replicating even more. You also get malignancies of all sorts. Kaposi's sarcoma is one of the skin cancers that was first uh, seen to be amplified in these individuals, but many others as well, neurological symptoms of all sorts. Really, this virus affects almost every uh, organ system. The virus gets into the CNS, you can see here's the, the blood brain, bra brain barrier. The virus is getting into the CNS. It can enter a number of cells in the CNS. In particular, it can get into mono microglia, macrophages. These cells then make a ton of different cytokines in the CNS, and they have toxic effects on neurons, for example. So a lot of the neurological symptoms of AIDS, neuro-AIDS as it's called, 
is due to the production of immune mediators in the brain when the virus gets in and, and interacts with these various cells. Cancers, HIV, uh, it leads to an increase in, in malignancy. 40% of people with HIV have cancers of various sorts. Uh, this is because the immune system is being trashed, and the immune system is important for, for tumor surveillance, of course. But also, this relates to the immune activation. Your immune system is cranking out cytokines at huge levels. What do cytokines do? One of the things they do is cause cells to divide. And if you remember from the transformation lecture, when cells divide forever, that's a recipe for transformation and eventually oncogenesis. So that's what we think is happening. The virus infection is making cells divide as a consequence uh, of these cytokines. Uh, where's the rest here? So Kaposi's sarcoma is an old skin cancer described a long time ago. Before AIDS, mainly seen in uh, older men in the Mediterranean area, probably immunosuppressed for some reason, because those are the only people that develop this skin cancer. It occurs in 20% of uh, HIV-infected men, 2% of women, and transfusion recipients. And it's because you get an infection with another virus at the same time, human herpes virus 8, that causes the Kaposi's sarcoma. So HIV immunosuppresses you, so this infection with this herpes virus becomes more likely. So before HIV, this was very rare. It only occurred in immunosuppressed people. But then when HIV came on the scene, many more immunosuppressed people, and now whenever they got infected with HHV-8, uh, you would get this skin cancer. And that was one of the first signs that the CDC was using to pick up uh, this infection. A couple of words about a vaccine. Can we make a vaccine? So here's a graph of viral load. You do make an immune response to the virus, but the virus persists. You make antibodies, you make T cells, and eventually the virus wins at the end. We do know that certain people who get super infected, like sex workers who get infected and then five years later get a different strain and so forth, each subsequent infection is less likely to occur. Okay, so there is some hope that a, an antibody response can be protective. But the problem is that the virus varies. You get infected by this initial virus. Let's call it the purple HIV. Within two weeks, you make purple antibodies. But by then, the virus has already changed. It's now an orange HIV. It's not neutralized by the purple antibodies. So you make another immune response. You now have a mixture of purple and orange antibodies, but now the virus has changed to blue. So this happens continuously, which is one of the reasons why we don't eliminate the virus when we make an immune response. There have been these very interesting broadly neutralizing antibodies identified in 20% of infected people. So they are antibodies that will neutralize blue and orange and purple strains. That's why we mean by broadly neutralizing. And they recognize conserved epitopes on the glycoprotein. So people are trying very hard now to make a vaccine that would elicit these kinds of antibodies. CTLs are also important for controlling uh, HIV. I told you there. There is an early CTL response, and that actually correlates with lowered viremia. If you take CD8 CTLs out of SIV-infected monkeys, uh, you get more disease. So for example, in an SIV-infected animal, uh, CTL uh, seems to be rising as the virus is declining. But if you remove uh, CTLs, now the virus replicates to higher levels. So there, we have to make a vaccine that can somehow induce CD8 positive CTLs. The best vaccine trial, and there have been dozens of HIV vaccine trials, called RV144. And it is a regimen where the individuals were first injected with a canary pox vector containing three viral proteins. Uh, and then they were given a boost of a recombinant GP120 protein, so purified glycoprotein of the virus. And this was done in 16,000 adult volunteers in Thailand. They got six primes and six boosts. And this was 31.2% effective. And what that means, out of these 16,000 people, 51 people got AIDS in the vaccine group, and 74 got AIDS in the control group. Do you know how expensive it is to run a 16,000 person clinical trial? It is enormous. And to get, this is not a very good number. 30%. You want over 90% for a vaccine, of course. However, it's the first positive result. 
So it gives you something to follow up on. So let me end with this, which really summarizes. You start with a chimp uh, infected with SIV, and somewhere around 1921, you have patient zero who hunts this chimp and gets infected with virus. And then he or she passes it on to today where we have 60 million infections and 25 million deaths. So I have great respect for all the people who have died of this disease and who are currently infected. But virologically, this is an astounding story. And this is really the quintessential uh, emerging virus.